testifies in grace, tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Cast 
I'm the EM pastor here at Cleveland KCPC. Hope you're doing uh, well during these difficult times and you're growing in your love for Christ and His people. Just a few announcements. We have a college lock-in uh, this Friday and Saturday. And so I think around 30 people have already signed up. If you have any questions or if you want to join the lock-in, you can talk to uh, Pastor L Lydia King as well. Also, young adult, there's a Bible study this Friday. The two family groups will meet. Also, Agape, uh, our next meeting will be on April 30th at 5 p.m. We're, we're still not, we'll find out hopefully this week. We're still not sure of the place. If worse comes to worse, we can meet at church. It'll definitely be somewhere in Ohio, but we will we'll let you know this week uh, through our group chat. Also, Building Hope in the City, we're continually um, asking people for any sort of clothes or toys that are in good condition. If you want to 
serve at uh, Building Hope in this city, um, uh, you can do that through a class they offer once a month. Also, this is uh, immediately after the service. Unfortunately, for the rest of you guys, we don't have food. We have that next week. But if you are a parent of first to fifth graders, there's going to be a PTA, PPTA, past, Pastors, uh, Parent, Teacher, and Association, right there at the cafeteria, right after the service. is a piece of lunch, and there's going to be a meeting for, uh, uh, for uh, parents and the pastor and the teachers there. So right after the service, if you have a first to fifth grader, uh, if you can join us at the cafeteria right after the service, and there'll be lunch for you. Um, also, um, uh, I don't know where she is. Heian, where is Heian? She's here. You can stand up. She's going to a mission trip in Thailand. If you'd like to uh, 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 support her prayer or um, uh, financially as well, if you want a, a support letter from her, from her, uh, please go to her. Uh, she'll need some um, prayer and financial support, but. Uh, you can talk to her and she'll give you, she's going to a mission trip later this summer to Thailand, right? And so if you can pray for her, uh, most of all. Now at this time, we're going to have a, a time of offering. We're going to have a time of offering at this time. Gracious Father, um, you who give every good and perfect gift to us, we thank you so much for, for your continual gener generosity. Um, and we pray that we will be more um, aware of your great gifts, especially the little ones, especially the, the ones that we do not see. And we thank you for the great resources that you've given each one of us an opportunity to give back to you and your kingdom. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can stand up at this time and join together in confessing our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From death he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Knowing that, knowing that we have all sinned and fall short of God's glory, let us confess our sins to God together in silence at this time. Friends, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. In him we're forgiven. Amen.
this time. Let's pray. Oh God, we are so amazed by your goodness to us. We're so amazed by your great story, your biblical narrative, the story of creation, the story of the fall, the story of redemption, the story of glorification, resurrection, and we, we thank you for the final state that we have in you. We thank you for creating us, creating us in your image with all the splendor and majesty. Forgive us, Father, when we turn away from you. Uh, forgive us when we think of ourselves more than you and people around us. May we obey the greatest commandment to love you and to love people. We thank you for this church, for its history, for all the saints that have come before us. We pray for those who are hurting and grieving, the loss of their loved one, specifically Elder Hong and um, their family. Thank you so much for his faithfulness. Thank you so much for his love for this church. Thank you so much, Father, for his service. And so, so many others who are grieving of the loss of a family or friend or maybe just going difficult times in their life. We know you are a great priest who can sympathize with all of our weaknesses. Only you completely understand us. We thank you that we have this hope in you, the only eternal hope. And we thank you for this prayer that you taught us 2,000 years, the prayer of hope, your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive, forgive us our debts, we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you can turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 to 25. It's a little long. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 to 25. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 to 25. Okay. This is the count of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no, work to, no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord had, God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah and where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs across the, along the east side of Asher, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you, you will certainly die. And the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man. He brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of God. 
I want to start today's sermon with a few questions, okay? Tell me if this has ever happened to you. You never manage your money. You have no savings whatsoever. You don't do any investments. You, sp- you don't keep a track of your spending. You spend as much as you want. You have no budget. You never pay off your credit card debt, your loan debt, your college debt, but you wake up one morning and you discover you're a millionaire. Has that ever happened to you? Okay? Or, this applies to many of us, you never work out, you eat whatever you want to eat, you have no exercise program whatsoever, you spend all day, every day, just on a, la- on a couch, what was it, lazy boy, you binge watch all day. But one day you discover that you can run a marathon in less than five hours, or you have the body of Moses. Okay? Does that ever happen to you? Okay? Or this applies to most of the men here. Or you're single, you never take a shower, you never deodorize, you never brush your teeth, you never wash your clothes, you come to church every Sunday, and the most beautiful, attractive woman you've ever seen says, come sit next to me. You smell fantastic. I love you. (laughs) Has that ever happened to you? Now, some of you wives, or if you're, if you're honest, you said, that happened to me, okay? My husband was exactly like that, okay? Or maybe you just struggle with what's it called? Smell blindness. You know what smell blindness is? You, ever, you know what blindness is? You can't see? Well, smell blindness is when you can't smell odor, okay? You never heard of it, okay? Of course, that never happens, right? That never happens. But here's the thing. There's, I think there's two ways to live. You can either live by design or by default, You either live by design, a purpose, or by default, okay? Now, if you live by design, you'll be very intentional with the way you live your life, right? You have a purpose that is greater than yourself, and you pursue it with zeal and passion, okay? And you you purpose to look for friends that hold you accountable, that spur you on toward love and good deeds. You'll examine your life on a regular basis. You have this strong sense of purpose and determination, Okay, and so you can either live by design with where you're one and only life or you'll live by default, okay? And so what does living by default means? That you will always take the path of least resistance. That's what it means. You kind of drift. You know something is wrong with your life. You know you're stressed. You know you're tired. You know you have bad habits, but you're not connected with God, okay? And that's not the way you want to live, but you just let it happen anyway, okay? You're not becoming the person that you know that you should, be, you should be or living the life that you should live. But you don't have any sort of energy of commitment to do what's right, to change. And that's where you will end up by just drifting by default. For example, if you don't choose gratitude by design, you will be ingra- full of ingratitude by default. It always happens. If you don't choose community by design, you will be isolated by default you'll be a lonely person. If you don't choose joy in design, you'll always be a resentful person by default, okay? Now, being, uh, um, living by design doesn't mean you have to be hyper-organized or you have to write everything down or something like that. It doesn't mean that. But it means to embrace the life that God has called each one of you to live, okay? Do you understand? So what I want to do today, and there's a reason why I'm going all the way back to Adam. Remember last week? Do you remember... Uh, Easter? You guys remember Easter, Resurrection Sunday? Or do you guys just remember the lunch that we had? Okay? Remember Resurrection Sunday, the greatest day in human history? Okay? I want to go back to the original design of human life, what caused the whole thing, right? And so today we're going to study about the the ultimate prototype. His name is Adam. Okay? And Adam is a word that simply means basically human. Okay? And so I'm going to talk about four core dimensions of every human life, okay, that are in Adam's story. Okay, I want us to be really practical, so I'm going to challenge everyone with these questions, okay? And this specific question, are you living your life by, uh, by design or by, de- by default? Okay, are you living your life by design or by default? Okay, and I want all of us to experience this wonder and worship of this incredible God, okay? And so this is what we're going to do, four dimensions. The first one is this. The first dimension I want to talk about is a body life. Believe it or not, you and I have a body. We all have a body. Everything that exists was designed by God. You know, Genesis starts in the beginning, God created, right? 
uh, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew is Bereshit El Elohim Bara. Bara means to create. Okay? And so it's you, that word Bara means to create is used 50 times in the Old Testament. It's only of God. God's the only one that uses that, that word. Okay? That means that God is the ultimate creator. He's the ultimate designer. Okay? Um, who are the famous designers these days? I, gosh, I don't. What's that purse? Coach? Uh, Louis uh, Vuitton? Okay, uh, uh, channel, channel, what channel? Okay, channel, I love channel. I love, I have different channels on my TV. Okay, uh, Target, he's incredible. Target is an incredible designer. Walmart, okay, Walmart, I'm just kidding. Okay, but God is the ultimate designer. And our universe has some sort of design. It's not just an accident. It has purpose, it has function. But in my humble opinion, I think one of the greatest design that God has ever made, don't look at my body, is the human body. Okay, Psalm 139 says this, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Listen, your, our God made your body by design and not by default. We are not some disembodied self. And so your body is extremely important to God. How you treat your body. Your body is sacred. Do you understand that? Your body is sacred. And nothing hardens the heart more than when you don't consider your body sacred. And according to Romans 8, God is eventually going to redeem our bodies. We're going to get new bodies. Praise God for that. Okay? And the body is so important. You ever heard of the incarnation? Jesus himself, the Son of God, came to earth in a bodily form. And he was born in a manger, in manure. Okay? And he died... He was crucified. His body was crucified, and his body was resurrected. So the body is very important. As, as, as messed up as our body is because of sin, our bodies are still extremely incredible. There's a book. I, I love this book, it's, okay? And it's called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made by a guy named Philip Yancey and Dr. Paul Brand. Okay, and Dr. Dr. Paul Brand, his whole life, worked with the leper community, leper colony. And I, I just want you to just marvel at this. This is what he wrote. We began as a single fertilized cell while you were still in your mother's womb. Get this. That single cell led to 60,000 miles, miles of capillaries and blood vessels forming precisely when and where they were needed. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your body has 39 trillion cells. That's more than Elon Musk, what he has times a million. Your body also has 39 trillion bacteria. And for some reason, by design, your immune system, if it's working well, knows which cells to attack and which to leave alone. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Get this. He says, your eyes are only 1% of the weight of your head. Your eyes are only 1% of the weight of your head. Now, if you're a typical Korean man's head, that's less than one-tenth of 1%. Okay? Your eyes have 120 million cones. Do you, did you hear that? These cones are so sensitive that the smallest unit of light, one photon, will register on them. You know, you guys know, continue to pray for Preston, that his eye surgeon had to be extreme, I mean, had to be extremely, extremely careful. Your eye is so sensitive, okay? Photons, that small unit of light. Um, you know, so your, 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 your eyes are fearfully and wonderfully made. I have a joke about the photons, okay? Do you want to hear it? Of course you do, because you are fearfully and wonderfully made, okay? A photon goes to the airport and tries to check his bags on the airplane. The flight attendant says, do you have any luggage? The photon says, no, I'm traveling light. My jokes are fearfully and wonderfully made, and your response is from the devil. Okay, just kidding, okay. okay. So another thing, this is what he says. Let me tell you the, about the birth of, of, of uh, the miracle of birth. In birth, you have a union of sperm and an egg that results in another human being that's made in the image of God. One sperm, right, and an egg that's bearing the image of God. You know what another miracle is, and I can share this, is that we have a new father of a daughter here at KCPC in Cleveland, while the new mother is in Taiwan. 
Let's congratulate Moses in jail, okay? They're going to have a new, okay? Okay? Your daughter is fearfully and wonderfully made. They're expecting their daughter in early September, hopefully Labor Day, okay? And so that's what Paul, Dr. Paul Brand says about the miracle birth. This is what he says. The mere existence of that one cell should be one of the greatest astonishments on earth. Do you hear what he says? The mere existence of that one cell should be one of the greatest astonishments on the earth. I, I, I think I told you the story. Uh, Dr. John Saul actually knows him. I think he's a nuclear physicist or something. My wife had a talk with him, and he used to work uh, at a nuclear submarine, and he says that nuclear submarine may be one of the most complex man-made uh, machines, okay? And he said this. He says, one single cell is far more complex than a nuclear submarine. Do you know what a nuclear submarine is? You know how many Trident missiles they have? You know how many countries they can devastate? One cell, and we have 39 trillion cells in what, 7.8 billion people on the earth, okay? And so our whole life, we should just be in our waking hours just telling each other how great our cell is. All day we should be talking about how great our cell is instead of spending all day how great our cell phone is, right? It's just mind-boggling. God didn't just create all of the universe, it's galaxies and stars and black holes and dark matter, but also your body from a single cell, and you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't that amazing? How can you not believe in God? It takes so much more faith not to believe in God, okay? And so your body is a gift. It says, and Paul says in Romans 12, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your body. It's not a neutral thing. So there's, there's nothing that will harden your heart more than when you treat your body in an immoral manner. Do you understand? Nothing will harden your heart more. Your body is sacred, okay? If, you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend says, oh, I, if you really love me, you, no, they don't love you, okay? Your body is sacred. They will, they will love you by having respect for you and keeping that which is most beautiful, most pure. Your body is not a machine. It is a gift from God. It's an amazing design. And I, it's just, it's holy, it says. Your body is holy, but so many people in our culture are taught to not like our bodies, right? And it's one, it's one of the striking things. It says that Adam and his wife were naked, and they felt no shame. The Bible never tells us what they look like. We don't know if they look, we don't know if they look like supermodels or not. We have no idea. But one thing we know is that they were not shaming their bodies, okay? We live in a culture of constant body shaming, don't we? Eating disorders, okay? Even body cutting. We have fear of aging and obsessing about our appearance and rejection. My body is too much of this or not enough of this. And as a church, I hope and pray that we agree with God's eyes that every body is holy, sacred to him. That means every age spot, every wrinkle, every gray hair, every non-hair, every face, every shape, every size, every color, every condition, able, disabled, disease or non-disease, your body was designed by God and it is precious and good to God. Okay? Amen? And so no longer do you think lowly of yourselves. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay? And one day our bodies will have this resurrected state. One day, everybody. You guys might know him, okay? Nick Wojcik, I don't know if you've heard of him. He has no limbs. He's a Christian. He tried to commit suicide at the age of 10. He's Australian, I believe. And he has no limbs at all. Uh, I, I forgot to put a picture of uh, Nicholas Wojcik. And he is such an inspiration. And he says, one day, my hope is that I will have a new body, and he will, a resurrected body. But until then, God made me perfect. Even though he has no limbs, he has no limbs whatsoever. No, no arms, no hands, no feet. And he's like, I can't believe I got this. I can't believe, God, you made me perfect in your eyes. Thank God. How much more us that God gave us a body. And so that's number one. Number two is work, work life. I think a lot of times we think that the Garden of Eden is like a retirement community. And that, that real, work didn't, you know, real work didn't come until after the fall. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> the first two chapters, I don't know if you notice, it's all about work. God is working. And then every six, after each day, he says, God rested. 
And then on the seventh day, he rested. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, every, I'm sorry. Every day he says, it is good. Then by the seventh day, he says, it is very good. After he makes, you know, humans and he rests. And he puts a man in the garden to work it. So God himself is the designer. He is a worker. And he made us in his image. God made the whole earth and he puts us in the garden, okay? And so in heaven, I remember one resident, her name was uh, Adaranke, Nigerian Christian, and she told me, I asked her, what do you think heaven's gonna be like? She said, sleep, I just wanna sleep. Unfortunately, you're wrong, <laughs> okay? You're gonna be working for eternity, but it's gonna be a glorious work. I love what Dallas Willard said, think of heaven as your most creative day for good and multiply it by infinite number. Think of your most creative day for good and multiply it by infinite number. Okay, I, I noticed that God did not create a garden. I mean, sorry, a, a jungle, but a garden. A garden is by design and jungle happens by default. It's called Hawaii, okay? With a garden, that's a gardener, okay? There's someone who's planting and, and weed eating and just taking care of it. This is a great picture of our work. And now this could be a, this could be a sermon within a sermon. And one of, I think, you know, if you guys ever want to uh, read a book by, it's called Every Good Endeavor by Tim Keller. It's so great. And he made a point in a book that for 2,000 years, the Western culture, manual labor was considered demeaning. That it's demeaning. Remember that. Okay? It's not. That's not true. And remember that when you take out the chairs after the sermon. Okay? The Greeks believed that the material world was evil and the spiritual world was good. So they, they believe that any work that you did with your hands, like pottery or, or, or uh, farming, was, was beneath them. And that real noble work was, you know, being a philosopher or poetry or preaching, okay? That's a higher kind of work. But farmers, janitors, that's dehumanizing. And so it's interesting. In the beginning of Genesis, who has literally his hands in the dirt? God. God is a manual laborer. That's part of his resume. Would you ever hire God, by the way? <laughs> okay, he's a man, his resume, okay? Manual worker. Sounds silly, right? But here he is planting a garden, okay? Now, in many Asian countries, which I will not name, many Asian countries in which I will not name, starts with a K, J, C, T, V, okay? I'm not going to name. Okay, there's only three respectable vocations, right? The joke is, what is it? doctor, lawyer, and maybe engineer, okay? They are on the only acceptable noble vocations, which I find ironic because many of these nations were originally agrarian culture, okay? And yet we look down on them, on farmers, unless there's a strike, okay? We start to death, okay? And have you noticed, like, for a lot of Asian parents, helping people is not one of the major reasons why they want their kids to be a doctor, Dispensing justice is not one of the reasons why you should be a lawyer. Okay, or building incredible, beautiful things is not one of the reasons why you should be an engineer. What is it? They want status, position, influence, money. Okay? Not all doctors. We have all the pure doctors in the world who do it for, the, for a pure motive, they all attend Cleveland KCPC. Okay? Now, at the bottom of that list is called pastor. I'm just kidding. But even pastors, you know, I had a good friend in name. He says Chi Song, okay, and lives in LA, Cerritos. And he, he said that his father was an atheist. And when he became a Christian in college, and he was about to like disown him. But then he said, okay, you can be a pastor as long as you're as famous as Billy Graham. It was all about status. It had nothing to do about help people, helping people, leading them to Christ. But here he says the simplest works are noble because we are made in the image of the creator. Okay, and so to be a creator, you create something beautiful, order out of chaos. In Genesis 1, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters and brought order out of chaos. The simplest work has dignity. This is very important. You know, we, we have a maid that comes to our house once a month. She, she brings order out of chaos. My job or my wife's job is not any better or more noble than hers. This is very important. This has to do with the doctrine of creation that everything that God made originally was good. It's good. And so there's no such thing as second-class jobs. There's a dignity of all work. And this is the job that Adam and Eve got before the fall. Okay? 
And, and, and so people are like, what is work about? And I think gardening, like I said, is the paradigm for work. Adam represents the whole human race. And so he, what, is, what does he do? He cultivates it and creates it and makes it beautiful. I love what Tim Keller says, if you can put it up. Work is rearranging a raw material of a particular domain to draw out its potential for the flourishing of everyone. Work is rearranging a raw material of a particular domain to draw out its potential for the flourishing of everyone. It means that you develop your domain, your work, your raw material. It's like music. You take the raw material of sound, which is part of our physical world, right? And you reform it, you make it beautiful, and then it brings meaning and love and depth to our life. Or architecture. Here's a stone, here's wood. Okay, here's iron, here's, here's steel. And you use, use these materials to make something beautiful like this gym that has a ceiling that is cracking. Okay, I made you look, right? Why do we need a building? So we can have human interaction, human conversation. Because you can't do that in Cleveland in the wintertime. You cannot create community in Cleveland outside in the wintertime. You can only say one word syllables like brr, cold, or three word sentences. Let's go inside. It's too cold, okay? It's made for human flourishing. That's what work it is. Even like investment bankers, okay? Like God has blessed you with money. That's a gift. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's so many needs around the world. And doesn't God want you to risk the resources that you have to bring flourishing in the, human, in the, in the world? I love what Andy Crouch says. The task that God gives to Adam and to each one of us is take the good God created and to add even more value to it. Did you hear that? The task that God gives to Adam is to take the good that God, already, that God has already created and to add even more value to it. In other words, we move from creation to culture, jungle to jerk, well, garden, and good to very good. Let me give you an example. God made eggs, but eggs benedict is very good. God made wheat, but cinnabombs, oh my gosh, is very good. Grapes are good, but candy grapes is very good. And then last of all, and most importantly, donuts are good, but Krispy Kreme is very, very, very good. And it's from God. Do you understand? So that's the fundamental challenge for each one of you guys. We are to take something that is good and make it very good. Do you understand? I love what Paul, Paul says. And so, so your work is, is a gift from God. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, human bosses, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Listen, I don't care how bad your boss is, how grumpy, whatever, here's the deal. He's not your boss, ultimately. Jesus is your boss. And one day reward is coming. Maybe you don't like your work right now. I, you know, that's whatever. But for the moment, you work whatever you do with all your heart. Do you have a great attitude, okay? Do you ask God in your work? Do you work with him? When you're in default mode vocationally, you're just punching the clock. You just check out. You're not working for God. You're not doing it with your whole heart. And this is very common, especially in the Western world. You know, Gallup, if you look at the internet, says two thirds of Americans are disengaging from their jobs. Two thirds, two thirds, 66.6667, you know, percent. John Maxwell said this, Outside of your genes, job satisfaction is the single most powerful predictor of longevity for your life. Do you understand? How many of you guys feel like you can die at any minute? Okay? Are you working by design? Okay? Or you rearrange a particular domain that God has given you to bring about flourishing? Now, if you do that, your work no longer becomes just the work. It becomes a passion. Okay? So why do you work? For status? For money? And you go, God knows you need money. God knows you need things like this. But if you're not defined by your work, then you have purpose in your work and you'll be serving God and his people. By the way, when I say work, I'm not just talking about vocational work. Okay. I hate it when people say, you know, stay at home husband or stay at home wife, that that's all they do. Trust me. That's one of the most important things in life. You are shaping someone made in the image of God, preparing them for eternity. That's a pretty high calling. Did you hear what I said? You are training someone made in the image of God, preparing them for eternity. You know, I told you this. I used to, once a week, 
have the kids all by myself when they were very young. It was the hardest day of the week. I felt like dying. I don't know how you house, husband, housewives do it. Stay at home. I don't know how you do it. I thought I was going to die. Okay? I mean, think about them. Kids are the worst bosses in the world. They're demanding. They don't pay you. You're always on call. Have you ever changed your, di- your baby's diaper and say, oh, thank you so much? Never. They are horrible bosses. They never say thank you. But we love them, right? Right? I, th- I think it's amazing that we're able to take something that God has made, creation to culture, from something even very bad to very good. But unfortunately, it says that when you take this fruit, you've eaten this fruit, you're going to die. And that's not a physical death only. It means every part of us started dying. The second law of thermodynamics, right? Everything's just, you know. And so God says when we work, thorns will come up. It's going to be very hard. And, um, you know, I mean, Tim Keller says this, that we can either have an overly cynical view of our work or overly romantic view of work. Overly cynical, you are, you are, you, he says that you are going against the doctrine of creation, that what God made was good. If you're overly romantic, you're going against the doctrine of the fall. Okay? I hear this all the time from young people. I'm, I'm just going to get the perfect job that's fulfilling. I'm going to work with perfect people, and we're just going to create great things. There's never going to be any issues. You know what that's called? That's called unemployment. You never worked. Okay? Sometimes you just have to make money to make things, you know, ends meet, especially if you have family. But in the garden, they knew their value. They knew their beauty. They knew God. They knew their significance. They knew that their lives mattered and counted. And now that we've lost that, okay, we're always trying to prove ourselves. And Tim Keller says, this work underneath our work, that's what creates the stress. It's not the actual work that's driving you crazy, that's, this, this, that's making you miserable. It's this constant gnawing sense that you're not good enough, what others think about you. That's what's making your life so miserable. And Hebrews says that you could, this, work, you can, you, this kind of work, you can get rest from. Because the only way you can have this deep, deep sense of rest is deeply understand how, what he thinks about you. That your life does count. That your body is important. That every little thing that you do is extremely eternal. That you are deeply significant. And if you really believe this, are you going to work hard? Yes, you are. You can probably maybe work even harder. But you no longer work for you. You no longer work for status and money. Okay, and all that stuff, you know, it's important, whatever. But now you're working for music. You're working for your patience. You're working for your congregation. And now those things become your primary goal, not all the nonsense. So that you have body life, and second thing, you have a work life. Number three, I'm almost done, you have a relation in life. It's amazing. He could have stopped with Adam. He says, it is very good. But then he says that Adam was alone. He says, it's not good. Okay, we were designed for connection. Okay? And when Eve was created, that word comes from the, in the, the rib. It actually means flesh. Okay? It's, it's like the Saudi beef came out of, I have a lot of Saudi beef, came out of the, the, the husband's side. And, and the idea is that in isolation, you are never complete. Adam was not complete. He needed to be made whole. He needed to be completed. And that does not mean marriage only. It can mean for, for any kind of relationships. I don't want in any way elevate marriage. Marriage is great, okay, but there's also a thing called the gift of celibacy. But let's start with marriage anyway, okay? It's amazing. Think about marriage. You know, think of like buying a house in Cleveland, okay? Because in, unless you live, I mean, in California, you can't afford a house, but in Cleveland, you can, okay? In California, I said last week, the only way you can afford a house is called winning the lottery, right? But in Cleveland, it's a realistic hope. But let's say you're building a house, and you have no blueprint. You have no idea he's going to look like wouldn't you be considered kind of foolish, okay? I'll just, I'll let you know when it's done, okay? But don't we do that in marriage life too? In our marriages, we're in default mode. You know, remember initially when Adam met Eve, he, he just breaks into poetry, right? I bet his heart was, was just melting. This is now my bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall come, she, she should be called, no, she shall be called woman. He's just in awe. He's like, wow, okay? Do you think he always spoke to Eve in poetry over time? Or do you think he just took her for granted by default? Eventually, you know, when she asked Adam, do you still love me? Did he eventually say, who else? 
because there's no one else yet, right? Because there's no one else. And, and a good marriage takes learning and studying and trial and error, time and observation. There are things that I understand about my wife for 13 and a half years that I didn't know 13 and a half years ago. Constant studying, constant examination. The moment that stops, you're going on default, and the ending will never be good, okay? And so when God asked Adam what he had done after he ate the apple, okay, what, what does Adam do? He throws Eve under the bus, okay? So God had to invent this thing called reconciliation. What's the first game that, that was ever played in human history? The blame game. That was the first thing that happened. And not just in marriage, in all relationships. Listen, God created you to be in community. It's unbelievable. And so are you living with design with people in your life? Are you friends with people who will spur you on, who will help you in, in, in your godliness? Do you call out the best in each other? Do you struggle? Do you share your struggles with them? Or do you just put your relationships on default mode? So are you connecting your relationship by design or default? Don't take it for granted. You have one relational life, your whole life, okay? And there are other human beings that love you and care for you. Please tap into that by design. And lastly, it's spiritual life. Above everything else, you were made for God. The whole universe was, exist, was created deeply so this magnificent God could come and live with us. I love what Adam in Genesis 3 says, the, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Walking is one of the simplest and oldest and most common activity that two human beings can do, right? You don't need any money to walk. You don't need any education. As long as there have been people, friends love to walk, either for recreation. Love, you ever seen lovers walk hand to hand? What's the most beautiful picture? Seeing, seeing 90 year old couples still hand to hand walking. And in Cleveland, we, we have walkable weather two or three times a month, two, two, three times, two or three months a year, right? It's great. The rest of the time, we can walk around our living room, right? Parents do it with their toddlers until they have that diaper change, which destroys community. You see old couples, they do it with canes or whatever, walkers. But this walking with God is this a picture of community. Enoch walked with God. Abraham walked with God. Moses walked with God. David walked with God. And it all began with Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. And I bet you, what do they talk about? Can you imagine walking with God? What do you talk about? Hey, God, I had a good day, but you already know that, don't you? You know, I mean, what do you talk? They talk about dreams for tomorrow. And God loved to take those walks. That was by design. And then what happened? They sinned. And what did they do? They hid. They no longer worshiped God. They started hiding from God. It's, an, it's amazing. When we hide from get God, we avoid people. Have you noticed that? We avoid. It's, we're very good at not thinking about God. And here's the main thing I want to tell you. I want to encourage you. What have you done? no matter how long you've been hidden from God, and you think of all the injustice of the world and the hate of the world, God has a design solution for them, for that. Okay, because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it's called the proto Ungelion. It says that God, God will just destroy the head of the serpent while the serpent will bruise the heel of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Though he will be wounded himself, God will crush the head of the serpent. That's the first gospel. It's a, it's a prophecy of the great redeemer that was to come because he is the second Adam. He is Adam upgrade. He is Adam 2.0, okay? And he came on the cross to die, for all, to die for Adam and Eve and all his offspring, which is us. And if you come out of hiding, if you confess your sins and repent from your old ways, God's face will always shine on you. You know, you guys... You know, you guys know my doxology that you hear all the time. You know, what did I say earlier? I talked about music, but when I sing it, it's sound. Okay, I'm not creating beauty out of sound. But what do I say in my benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the light of, him, of his glory give you shalom. And so that's my prayer for you. As you begin to swap with God, just remember that your body is a gift from God. Keep it pure in every way. Nothing will harden your heart more than making your body not sacred. Number two, make your, your work is a gift from God. 
is a gift from God. How many people would love, would die to be in your place? Number three, you have this relational life with, God, with each other. Please, if you're, if you're lonely, I hate to say this, most of it is your fault. I know that sounds really harsh. Most of it is your fault. Stop blaming other people. Go seek community. It really is. And number four, worship God, okay? Worship God. He'll make every, everything else will fall into place. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you so much for, for creating us. You are the great designer. You're the great creator. You're the great loving God. And more than anything, we are to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you so much for loving this community. I pray specifically for those who are hiding, who are running away. Oh Lord, you say that as long as we come with come to you with a broken heart, you will always start a relationship with us. You will always forgive us. And from there, I pray people will be plugged in to relationships and community that is pleasing to you. We thank you and praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If we could all stand up and, and praise God. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of bliss, when fears are still and strive.
here in the power of Christ I stand. Just, just a, a reminder, uh, immediately after the service, those who are parents of first to fifth graders, if you could meet at the cafeteria, to, uh, cafeteria right after, the, after this is over. And also remember, if you can do some manual labor, immediately after this is over, and put the chairs to the side as well. Let's pray. <clears throat> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the light of his presence grant you peace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.